All right, so this is lecture 28, which is on um, some applications, some select applications of the uh, Gauss-Bonnet theorem. I keep forgetting my cover-up page. Um, so let's just talk about some things. Uh, this is, of course, taken from O'Neill, uh, section 7.7, .7, more or less. So if we put geometry on the torus, as an example, um, 7.2, or wait a minute, Anyway, the example in chapter 7, we calculated explicitly that the point set with induced geometry had um, total curvature 0 because the Gaussian curvature was less than 0 and positive and, and greater than 0 symmetrically on the inner and outer um, part of the torus, if you think about. Um, remember, specifically, u from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 had negative curvature when the parameter u went from, you know, like, the rest of the parameter on the outside of the, uh, the torus is where the Gaussian curvature is positive. Um, but on the flip side, you can show that the total curvature of the torus is zero because it's Euler characteristic. So total curvature of torus is 2 pi times Euler characteristic, well, 2 pi times 0, 0. Which is, you know, it's very, very, very labor-saving. Because it was actually a lot of work to prove, to work out this calculation, right? It was not, not the simplest thing, and that, so that's a, you know, a good application. It's just the simplicity in calculating total Gaussian curvature of certain examples is one thing you can do. Um, let's see here. We also have those theorems that I quoted you from topology about adding handles to things. So um, a torus is... Another way to think of it is a sphere with one handle <laughs> added to it. And so the Euler characteristic of a sphere with h handles, though, is 2 minus 2h. And um, so, you know, this is just consistent with what I just said. The Euler characteristic of the torus is 0. In other words, it's a sphere with one handle, which is also consistent with this equation. All right? Um, okay. Um, if we delete a point from the sphere, as an example, um, chapter 7, we saw that there was a flat metric that we could put on the deleted sphere, the punctured sphere, right? And that, of course, had uh, curvature 0, right? Gauss uh, total, um, well, that had local <laughs> Gaussian curvature 0, of course, it also had global Gaussian curvature 0. But on the flip side, you can't just do anything your heart desires um, with these, these new constructions we have. For example, um, we are limited in the fact that we cannot put a metric on the whole sphere for which the, um, the Gaussian curvature is, is negative. And the reason for that is the following. If there was such a non-standard metric on the sphere, such that the, um, you know, the... Uh, Gaussian curvature was everywhere non-positive. That would imply the total Gaussian curvature was less than or equal to zero. But the Euler characteristic is independent of our choice of metric. It's topological. So the, um, you know, 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of the sphere, well, Euler characteristic of the sphere was what? It was, it was 2, wasn't it? Um, so that's, that's greater than zero, and that's, that's inescapable. So that means we can't find a, um, can't find a metric on the sphere which gives it, uh, negative, um, everywhere negative, uh, everywhere non-positive, to be more accurate, um, <clears throat> Gaussian curvature. So we have the following statement. If a compact orientable geometric surface M has Gaussian curvature positive, then M is diffeomorphic to a sphere. And the proof is simple. If the Gaussian curvature is positive, that implies that the Euler characteristic must be positive. But the Euler characteristic of any compact orientable geometric surface is related to a sphere with handles. In particular, it's diffeomorphic to a sphere with h handles. But if 2 minus 2h is, um, right, in order for this to be positive, we can only have h as an integer. Um, 
<laughs> you can't add half a handle. So um, h is an integer that forces us to choose h equal to zero. In other words, the other characteristic of two, which means up to a diffeomorphism, it's a sphere. All right. So again, a surface with positive, uh, you know, everywhere positive Gaussian curvature must be diffeomorphic to a sphere. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm, I'm picking through some of my, my favorite bits of section 7.7, .7, which is page 376 to 384 of O'Neill. I do think I've skipped a little bit here and there, but um, here's, this, here's the greatest hits, in, in my <laughs> humble opinion. Anyway, corollary 7.4, the following properties of a compact oriented surface are equivalent. Now, we've already done a little bit of this, but let's uh, put it all together. Number one there exists a non-vanishing tangent vector field on M. To which you might go, what does that have to do with these things? I know, right? Two, the Euler characteristic of M is zero. Three, M is diffeomorphic to a torus. Um, so let's, let's go through these. Go on to these things. So we'll prove, look at the proof, one implies two. Let V be a non-vanishing vector field on M. That's the assumption. Then for any geometric structure on N, the associated frame field, we can build an associated frame field from a non-vanishing vector field. That's the thing. So you normalize the vector field. That gives you E1. And then, remember, M is oriented, so there exists DM. So we have the rotation operator. So E2 is JE1. Um, and then, so, that gives us the global frame on M. Now, if omega 1, 2 is its connection form, then d omega 1, 2 is equal to minus kdm. All right. So we can apply the gauss binet theorem and generalized Stokes theorem to obtain the following. So first of all, 2 pi times Euler characteristic is equal to the integral of the total Gaussian, is in the total, total Gaussian curvature of the surface. But that's equal to the integral of minus the exterior derivative of the connection form, right? But by generalized Stokes theorem, that is the integral of the 1-2 um, the connection form over the boundary of M. But the boundary of M is empty <laughs> for compact-oriented surface, so this is 0. So consequently, the Euler characteristic is 0, so that's 1 implies 2. To get 2 implies 3, well, that we already argued back on the previous page, because there we argued that if the Euler characteristic, if the Euler characteristic was 0, then it had to be um, that we had h equals to 1. What did I argue that? I don't know if I argue. Yeah, I did argue that. That was not at the end of the last page. It was at the start. Of the start. That was the first thing we said in this lecture. Um, so that's 2 implies 3. And then to get 3 implies 1, for, to get 3 implies 1, for a torus with the usual parameterization, either of the partial velocities provide global non-zero tangent fields, right? So that's pretty cool. So one of the um, side effects of this little corollary is that there is no, there does not exist a non-vanishing tangent vector field on a sphere. All right. Um, which means that if you're, if you're combing your hair and for some reason you had a head which was a sphere somewhere, you got to have no hair. <laughs> Anyway, um, let's see here, although not, I mean, I guess diffeomorphically, do we have spherical heads? I don't know. I mean, how many, how many holes do you have in your head? I don't, I don't know. But, uh, or how many handles, how many handles have you attached to your head? I think some of the things I see, seems like people are interested in making all kinds of weird topological uh, modifications of their body. Anyway, sorry. Um, okay, our work with uh, being culturally insensitive. Oh my goodness. Anyway, our work with rectangles naturally transfers over to similar arguments with polygonal decomposition. Again, you can look at some of that in Lee's text. You'll see explicit computation for the of the gauss binet theorem for a triangularization in any event. So the following is true. Here is the um, grown-up gauss binet uh, P is an oriented polygonal region and a geometric surface, then the total Gaussian curvature is the sum of the 
the arc length integral over the boundary of the polygonal um, region of the geodesic curvature plus the sum of the exterior angles, that's going to be equal to 2 pi times the other characteristic of the polygonal region. So, for example, the following is classically of great interest. If, a if, if, um, if that's a triangle in an oriented geometric surface M, then the, the total Gaussian curvature of the triangle is equal to the sum of the geodesic curvature around the boundary of the triangle. Oh, excuse me, total Gaussian curvature of the triangle plus the integral over the boundary of the triangle of the geodesic curvature has to be equal to 2 pi minus the, minus the exterior angles, or as is more fun to say, it's equal to the sum of the interior angles minus pi. All right, so classic, you know, so um, that means there's a relation between the area interior angles of triangle and the curvature of space. It gets thrown out a lot in popular math or popular science fiction, right? Um, in particular, if we take the, the uh, if we take this and we have this at geodesics, uh, if we have a triangle with geodesic sides, then geodesics have geodesic curvature zero, right? They're lines, generalized lines in our surface. And so if we have geodesics forming the, the you know the sides of the triangle, curved triangle, right? Um, then this term drops out and you just have that the integral of the total Gaussian curvature is equal to the sum of the interior angles minus pi. If in addition you have that you have constant Gaussian curvature, then you can pull the k out and then you just have the integral over the triangle of dm, but m is the area form, dm is the area form. So that integral just gives you area. So you get this really, really simple and fun thing to talk about even to children that the Gaussian curvature times the area of a triangle is the sum of the interior angles minus pi. So in particular, when the curvature is zero, in other words, when you're in the Euclidean context, you get Gaussian curvature zero, and you get the sum of the interior angles of a triangle is pi. Well, you're like, of course, what else could it be? Well, glad you asked. A couple of important examples, since we have all of this in front of us that we can do now. We, um, one application, you could look at a sphere, right? You can look at one of these triangles that has a 90 degree angle at each corner. Kind of, kind of funny. So for a surface with positive, um, Gaussian curvature, the triangle can have an excess angle beyond pi for the sum of the interior angles, right? This has three pi over two, or, you know, the sum of the angles is 270 degrees, if you want to go that way. On this disk model of the hyperbolic plane, which we can construct to have constant curvature minus one, the interior angles um, actually are less than 180 degrees. Remember, this is conformally related to the plane, so we have this convenient geometric um, cheat that the angle that you see here actually is the hyperbolic angle. Um, because it's conformally related to the, to the plane. So anyway, the sum of the interior angles can be less than 180 degrees there because it's, the curvature is negative in hyperbolic space. Now, just to make, make it really explicit, let me just show you here, for that great triangle um, formed by this one-eighth of the sphere, right? There's just one-eighth of the sphere, so the area for this bit is one eighth of the total area. The total surface area, of course, is four pi r squared. So one eighth of four pi r squared, and if we, let's, let's take r equal to one, okay? So four pi over eight is pi over two. So <clears throat> k times pi over two is pi over two. That's this term. And so we have the sum of the interior angles is pi plus pi over two. That term coming is coming from the positive curvature of the sphere. And, um, of course, you can, you can generalize this to a sphere of radius r, and um, r is cancel in such a way because the Gaussian curvature is 1 over r squared. This has an r squared, r squared over r squared is 1, and so you get k is pi over 2 independent of the, uh, the radius of the example. So this, this example works for all radius. So this, is, this has been known for a while. I mean, um, you know, Euclidean geometry thrived for a couple millennia, and... Um, you know, we worked and worked and worked and worked in the mathematical community to refine the axioms and to try to, you know, distill it down to a minimal number of axioms. And 
people had misgivings about this this parallel postulate, you know, um, which I I try to remember how to go exactly. Um, but certainly the hyperbolic geometry has these these parallel lines, which um, you know end up meeting at infinity, which is at odds with how parallel lines, of course, work in Euclidean space, right? Parallel lines don't meet, um, so that's kind of troubling. Um, and Gauss, Gauss was aware of the possibility of constructing non-Euclidean geometries um, before it was popularly known, but it's, um, it's known that he, he withheld his work because it was, it was just so deeply ingrained, the study of Euclidean geometry. It was hard to talk people out of it, but by the mid 19th century, it had become clear that there were other geometries possible that were um, logically consistent and certainly non-Euclidean. So um, one of the one of the things that you could do to look for whether or not um, you know the geometry of physical space itself was curved is you could set up really big triangles, right? And you could try to go look and see. Are those triangles, you know, what's the uh, the angles inside the triangle? And so, some people think that that's what Gauss was looking for, in in when he was doing um, surveying work. For, in 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 for some reason he did these the surveying work with these giant giant triangles. It's like, well, what's he doing? Well, maybe he was looking for, um, you know, slight curvature of space. We do that even now, with some of these very very large experiments looking for gravity waves. Um, gravity waves will cause a distortion in the curvature of space-time. But the thing is, the curvature is, the, the distortion is so slight, you'd have to set up really, really large, really, really large triangles in order to detect this sort of things. And so that's what they're they're doing, or have done. I actually, I, don't, I haven't followed it. I'm not sure if it's been done or not or yet. If it actually has been done already or not. But uh, the idea was to set up these three satellites, you know, really, really far removed from one another, and then a laser would shine, um, you know, make a giant triangle in space, and you could perhaps detect angle deficiency in some sense that way. I mean, that's one way of looking at it, but I'm sure the technical details are a little bit more than just that. But um, anyway, it's interesting, though, that something as simple as a triangle can reveal to you whether or not you're living in a flat or curved space. So... If you ever wake up one morning and find yourself two-dimensional, if you want to see where you are, draw a triangle and measure the angles. Thanks. Anyway, that's all I got for, um, pretty much all I got for O'Neill's text. We're now going to go over and talk about the first, second, and third fundamental forms, um, which is the other way of looking, a calculational scheme for differential geometry. And then after that, we'll hopefully go over to Tap's book and um, look at that. Although that's not really differential geometry, that's just fun. Anyway, thanks.